Welcome everybody. We've got 80 people signed up today. So I will give it a few minutes to let people join us. Um, as you know, this is being recorded. So it will be available on demand on our YouTube channel. If you are watching this on demand on our YouTube channel, can you remember to press like and subscribe? I know everybody on YouTube says that, but it really is the best way that we can get recognition for our fantastic industry. Hello, Alistair. Hello, Bard. How are you? Clivia, Mary, good to see you. Um, so what I always say, which is that we would much rather be doing this in person, in a conference room, in a nice hotel somewhere, but we're not. And so luckily we have the genius fantasticness that is Zoom. Um, I am absolutely delighted to introduce John Harmon. I'm sure most of you know John. Um, we've been very lucky enough in the past to have John speak at several of our events. And, and as I say, John uh, spoke at our spring summit and so today's session is um the assignee experience stress in the pandemic i think after the year that we've all been through this is a very very timely um session oh my watch is now talking to me um apologies so as i say i'm going to leave it a few more minutes for people to come in because there are a lot of people signed up for today um which is great so and at the moment we're still looking up to 10 so before we get going um what else can I tell you about, um, well, John will introduce himself in a moment. I'll hand over to you, John, and, um, and that can happen. But for those of you who are already here, we regretfully announced this morning that we won't be able to run the September, hoped for September event that we were going to run in London. Um, we just had the results of the survey that we sent out to everybody and they were not encouraging enough. Obviously people are still um, concerned about travel, but more concerned about having to quarantine on return from an event. That's still something which is changing on a daily basis all over the world, as you all know. Um, so as I say, we are recording this. It will go up onto YouTube over the weekend. So if you are watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Um, we are three minutes in. There are still a lot of people to join. Um, so I will give it another few minutes just to allow people to come in. But as I was to say, I know, like I say, we've got eight people signed up, but we all know now that these are um, go, that these go on demand onto YouTube. So you will be able to watch it at any time. And I think people are very aware of that. Um, plus the fact, of course, you know, things crop up during the day. We're all getting a bit busier, which is great news. And so, um, you know, if there are fewer participants live, then so be it. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please just go to the bottom of the screen and open the chat box. That will open up at the side. Just remember that um, Zoom, ah, I think they may have changed the default. No, you still need to, if you want to make a comment in the chat box, just arrow down, It'll, the default is host and panelists. If you arrow down to everyone, then everyone will see your comment. If you just want to send a note to uh, myself or John, then put, just put it in host and panelists. You can also use the Q&A button, which is a slightly different format for exactly the same thing. So if at any time you've got questions, just pop them in and John, you'll come to those at the end. I don't think it's, um, you know, this is a, a terrific presentation. It's better to go all the way through before we do a Q and A. Well, we're coming up to five past, so I think we might as well get going. John, I'm gonna hand over to you and make you the host. And I will stop my video and I will put myself on mute. So John, you should have the host control now. All right, I'll give it a shot. Here Great. Go. Tell me when you see it as slideshow, Don. Okay, I can see it as PowerPoint, not yet. Ah. <clears throat> there we go, perfect. Oh, by the way, if for anybody watching, if Zoom opens your whole screen out on Slideshow, just press escape and it'll bring it back down to a, a closed window. John, thank you so much. It's great to My have you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dom. And, and really, that's where I want to start is thanking you and Euro for this opportunity. Anybody that knows me um, knows I enjoy talking, especially, especially about interesting ideas. And so I I appreciate you giving me the this opportunity this format and while i'm at it i want to thank court as well because um since i've been with court coming up on oh my goodness eight years now um, they've always been very generous and supportive of my interest in and pursuit of these types of topics and how they relate to our work and relocation and uh, they've been a terrific uh, employer in that regard and supporting me in some of these endeavors endeavors a lot of which end up as internal training at, at court as well so thanks for the time I am, I'm, the, the, you know, this talk originated purely as a talk for the relocation world, and it was about um, stress and how it relates to the assignee experience. I think uh, it, it just makes too much sense to not, or it just would seem wrong to not 
tie the topic or the, the understanding of stress that I share here in with our own personal experience of the pandemic in the last year. So there'll be a bit of both in this talk. It's not the same session as the closing sessions. You're a lot of the slides are shared, but the focus is a bit different. And um, and, and so with that, I'll, I'll jump right in. You know, we have all of us working around relocation at one point or another, we hear that famous saying that moving is one of life's most stressful events. And some of you may have heard me uh, share this story before, but I was getting ready to give a talk to a bunch of embassy professionals in Washington, Washington DC about the relocation industry. And I wanted to quote that, but I wanted, I was wondering, where's the science behind this? How can I validate this claim that moving is one of life's most stressful events? So I looked around and, you know, I was, I was curious, who are these people that are measuring stress and, and deciding which events are the most stressful? And it turns out there were a couple of guys. Um, I don't have both of their pictures, because they were stars in psychology before YouTube and before they could post videos and do a TED talk or things like that. But um, Thomas Holmes, who's no longer with us, and this is Richard Ray on the right, um, way back in the late 60s and early 70s, started doing this research on stress where they actually, what they would do is go into hospitals with a questionnaire and interview. They interviewed thousands of people who were in the hospital. And the questions were around what was going on in their life in the time up before, in the six to 12 months up before the time that they became ill. And they were trying to connect um, life events with illness or stress with illness. And they came up with this rating scale. So there's this chart that's on the right that lists life events. And at the top of the list is uh, death of a spouse and divorce, marital separation. It goes right down to the bottom, um, uh, minor violations of the law. You also notice on the list are positive things like vacation or major holidays or um, you know, planning a wedding because those can be stressful as well. But basically, you, you, you go through and you tick which of these were happening in your life in the last six to 12 months, and then you take the point, your units assigned to that particular life event, and you add up your total score, and you end up with a scale of how likely you are to end, have a serious health outcome. And uh, if you, what's interesting is if you look at the list, uh, moving isn't on there. Moving itself isn't on there. But if you add up all the variables that are at play when you're moving, uh, moving really does get a very high score, close to this uh, 300 plus, 80% chance of health breakdown in the next two years. And then what's interesting is Holmes Ray, um, they, they call this chart the social readjustment rating scale. So readjustment has to do with change. And you can see how if readjustment is stressful, then you can, it's not so hard to imagine how relocation is stressful. And of course, that moving score of 300 plus assumes that everything else is perfect in your life. You know, there's no marital stress, that your parents are healthy, you're not worried about whether you should move them into assisted living, you've got no conflict with your teenage daughter, and you've got a perfect boss. So when you add moving on top of regular life stress, um, you can you can see how it truly is one of life's most stressful events. And so, and and the, the measure or the name for the units in the Holmes Ray scale are change units. And so there's that key word again, change. Um, change is a factor in stress. And there's this other guy, Alan Kammer, who came along a about a decade later, and he said, yeah, I get it. Major life events are stressful. But for me, you know, what I find stresses me is daily hassles, right? And then he looked at uplifts too, things that would uplift you during the day as well, the kind word for, for, from a friend and how that might counter stress. But he had, he has his own scale where people have to go through and, and you know, rate how, many, how often these things happen to them on a regular basis and how it's impacting them. They add up their score, you know, is your roommate, and this is one for college students actually, is your roommate messy or are you concerned about your future plans or other students are unfriendly or was the library too noisy? Um, did you, do you get irritated when you have to prepare meals? Are you stressed about how you look? Too few dates, all the things that might be in the mind of a 20 year old. And lo and behold, you know, Cantor added these things up and he found out that uh, that um, hassles are stressful as well. Getting a flat tire or being stuck in traffic on the way to work can trigger stress. And so, but if you think about it, moving is this mix of a major life change along with a whole lot of daily hassles. And, and it actually is very stressful. And tying that back to the pandemic, you know, pandemic is the same thing. We've all experienced major life change and a whole lot of little changes in the way live, we live daily, whether it's having kids around while you're trying to do a PowerPoint or, you know, forgetting a mask when you go to the store, um, all these little daily hassles that add to our stress as well. And if you saw the talk that I gave for Europe back in April, I actually added some other factors you know, pandemic living involves major life change, daily hassles, tons of uncertainty, which is stressful. Prediction error, which is this concept I won't go into, but the fact that so much of what we're experiencing is new to us as individuals and as a society. And that's a source of stress as well, because we like to know what's coming next. 
and we're not able to predict. And then relational poverty, which is a, which is a term in social psychology, which you know, we're, the social isolation, all those are added source of stress. So if the pandemic has felt miserable to many of us, there's certainly a good reason. We all talk about stress a lot, but it, it, and stress is such an important part of our understanding of ourselves and the modern world. But I think it's worth pausing to ask actually, what is stress? You know, it's a word we all use regularly and often, but it, looking at this image, you know, is stress the hand pushing down on the little guy or is it how the little guy's feeling inside, right? Is it something from the outside or something that refers to us on the inside? And technically really the definition is the hands, the stressor and stress is the experience of the individual. And that, that concept of stress has been around for a long time, but the sort of the modern understanding of stress and how it impacts us physically started with this gentleman, Hans Selye in the late 1930s. He's a Hungarian working in Canada. And uh, he kind of, he started to identify the physiological changes that take place in a body that's on, of, of an individual or, a, or in this case, his work was with rats that's under stress. So things like, um, you know, stim overstimulation of the brain or muscle or joint pain, increased heart rate, um, poor digestion, um, all, these, all these factors, uh, increased adrenaline, cortisol, all these factors, um, he added up and called them general adaptation syndrome. And his definition for stress was the nonspecific response of the body to any demand for change. Nonspecific meaning it's not always the same. Uh, the constant would be that you're dealing with change. So there's that word change again. And, um, and, 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 you know, this lady, if you look at this lady, I was kind of, this lady just signed up to move her family halfway around the world. Her husband's quitting her, his job and she's got two school-aged children. And she was up late at night planning to move and she came on the home's race scale and uh, she's feeling pretty concerned. So a lot of talk about stress. I've got a few kitten breaks in here um, to help us alleviate the stress. The truth is, uh, unless you absolutely hate kittens and I, and I don't know how this picture could simulate a stressful response in you, but probably just seeing this image made you feel a little better. But back to the talk, here's our assignee. The truth is, if you look at the research and, and everything I just explained, you we'd think that and you, and you trust what the media is telling us about stress, you think that every assignment would end here, right? Or here, right? All of our signees would end up seriously ill or maybe even dead from all the stress of moving, but it doesn't happen that way. And so despite all the hype in the media, we need to take a broader picture to understand that there's more to the story about stress. And so I kind of, I think everything I've talked about so far speaks to what we know or what we hear in, in, in the media but I want to talk a little bit more and give us more of a nuanced view of stress and why it's not necessarily the same experience for all of us. And the first, first thing we need to do when we're looking at research or reading about or understanding stress is to take all research that we read about with a grain of salt. You know, research reveals probabilities and the media then turns those probabilities into articles which they present as facts. I love this headline, could a curry a week prevent dementia? Um, I doubt that, you know, God forbid any of us gets a dementia diagnosis, but if, if we were in that position, I doubt that the doctor's gonna be saying, oh, should have had more curry. You know, you could have prevented this. I don't think any of us is foolish enough to believe, believe that um, eating curry is the secret to our future, you know, the health of our brain. But there was one study probably that linked turmeric um, to, to diminishing the proteins that are involved in Alzheimer's and who knows how strong that correlation was, but it turns into a headline like this. And the truth is I would argue that these headlines become stressful because we think we need to be eating salmon and blueberries and turmeric to take care of our brain. And um, it's just too much to keep up with. So research reveals probabilities which are then presented in the media as facts. And we need to be a bit more savvy. In fact, effect, the measure of the strength of an effect in psychological research you can have a pretty insignificant effect and still have it called, it, it, you know, to, to the normal point of view, it'd be insignificant. But to psychologists, um, they report it as significant. The scale looks like this. And so going back to that Holmes Ray chart that I talked about in their famous study in 1967, the effect in their research was 0.118, which is on the small range, right? But it's reported and understood. It's one of the most famous studies on stress that's out there. It's, and it's influenced everybody's view about how life impact in events can impact our health. And yet, if you go back and look at the original in research, the effect was pretty small on the lower end is of what is even considered publishable. Um, this, if you look at this correlation, so just to give you an idea of what the, that Holmes Ray 0.118, look at the chart on the bottom right. That's a 0.07 effect. 
So the Holmes Ray results didn't even fall in. They, they were somewhere between the bottom two results. To me, fairly close to random, and yet they're headline news. And looking at Alan Canner and his daily hassles, I've highlighted in red some of the elements of his study. He, he looked at 100 people, 52 women and 48 men. They were average age 45 to 64. They were predominantly white and from California. Right? So he looks at 100 Californians and asks them about stress in their lives, and then their conclusions that are reported all over the media about how stress impacts everybody. Um, and, and, the, and, and the places those types of studies show up are in magazines like these, and we look at them and we get more stressed out. I mean, this, this issue alone is my favorite. It's going to help you rebuild your confidence if you lost your job. It's going to help you avoid a midlife crisis and re reconnect with society and discover bliss by the sea. It's going to get rid of your anxiety and help you be more calm with seven steps. Um, it's going to help you understand how to be a good enough parent. And after lockdown, it's going to help you create a whole new world, all in one magazine. And yet people look at these and think there's something wrong with me if I can't figure out how to do this. And the research that they're basing these articles on um, may have a minimal effect to begin with. So again, I'd encourage us to take research with a grain of salt and not look to the popular media for information about stress. Look to our own personal experience. And then the, the next thing to consider is the biggest variable in, in stress research is people. And people are different. You know, this guy, I love to quote David Eagleman. He's a, he's a neuroscientist. He was at Baylor University for a while. He's written a few books, hosted a PBS special. Now he's in the private world um, using what he knows for help with inventions. But, you know, basically what he's saying here is that every single one of us is unique. We're the mix of our genes and our experience. And so we experience the world in our own unique way, including stress, and that's what explains these charts that are all over the place. You can't get a straight line when you study human beings because human beings are so different. As an example, let's take an anecdote or a little story on, you're in line at the airport, you're going to visit your grandmother who you haven't seen because of the lockdown, it's your first trip, and you get to the gate and you're rushed, you're late, and you get to the gate attendant and the gate, or excuse me, you get to check in and you find out that your suitcase is a bit too heavy. And you've got about 20 minutes to get through passport control and security and get to the gate. And there's no, you know, you're going to have to either throw away the present you bought for your grandmother who you haven't seen in two years or ditch some clothes because there's no time to get a, to get a suitcase, a new suitcase or an extra bag. So how, how would we respond to this? I think that every single one of these responses, this is your fault, this limit on the bags is stupid. Or this fault, oh, or this response, sorry, or this response, just laughing at the irony of it all. You can imagine, I think we can imagine any one of these is a legitimate human response to that circumstance. And so again, we're different. So our response to stress is different as well. And I would argue that for the people that we're helping to move, um, if you were to put them on a scale of adaptability or the ability to handle change, I think assignees would be over at the right on able to handle a great deal of change. And so again, that's why they're probably not always overwhelmed by the stress of adding a move to their normally stressful lives. So again, the biggest variable in stress research is people. Take the research with a grain of salt. Our mindset about stress matters. The way we think about stress influences our experience of stress. Way back in the last century, William James noted that our greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over the other, which is a, a freedom we have in the face of any stressor. More recently, Ellen Langer, who was the first um, tenured professor in psychology at Harvard, she's a brilliant lady, talks about how stress isn't a function of events, but our view of those events. And there's actually research to back this up. In fact, Aliyah Crum heads the Mind Body Lab at Stanford University, and she was a student of Ellen Langer's. And uh, one, of the, one of the studies that she did involved the Trier Social Stress Test. So you might, might wonder, if you're doing psychological research, how do you put somebody under stress? And the Trier Social Stress Test is one of the tools they do this. The way it basically works is you sign up to be a part of the study. You say, sure, I'll take $75 or whatever as a college student to participate in this study. And you show up and they sit you in a small room with a couple of books or magazines on a topic. Let's say you're going to write about um, climate change. And they say, okay, in a few, you've got 15 minutes to prepare for a talk about climate change. Just go ahead and take notes, put them in order. When you get in the room, there'll be a panel of three people. You'll be able to look at your notes, so don't worry. So you outline your talk. 15 minutes later, they bring you into this room with three panelists, very professional people sitting across from you. And the first thing they do is take away your notes. And then the panelists are coached or trained to be completely e either neutral or negative, rolling their eyes, checking their watch, um, shaking their head. 
So you're there presenting on a topic you're not an expert in in front of people, a very negative audience. And then afterwards they'll measure, oh, and then I'm sorry, when you leave, when you leave there, they take you to another room and they ask you to count backwards, let's say by sevens from 438. So you start counting backwards and every time you mess up, they say, ah, oh, start over, start over. And at the end of this experience, they check your stress hormones, right? So, and one of the things they're looking for is what they call the growth index, or at least the Leah Crum and her study, study was looking for, was this concept of the growth index, which is the ratio of cortisol, which we all know is one of the stress hormones, which is actually a good thing as long as it's not in your system all the time, to DHEA. DHEA is a hormone that's a, a brain chemical that's involved in learning. And, and memory and, and storing, you know, store, storing memory and, and what you take away from an experience. And so before they put people through the Trier social stress test, one group just went straight, one, one group got a training on stress and how the typical information we get, how stress is bad for you and we shouldn't be under stress. So they were triggered to think of stress as a bad thing. The other group got a training that basically said stress can be enhancing. Stress is your body's way of of gearing up to face a challenge. If your heart rate goes up, it doesn't necessarily mean you're nervous. It could mean you're excited about what you're about to do. And so there was a three minute training they got before they went into the trio social stress test. And the people that got the stress can be enhancing uh, talk before they participated in the test had significantly higher ratio of DHA to cortisol in their system. So what was a stressful, very stressful experience for the other participants turned out to be a learning experience for them. So again, <laughs> excuse me, it was their mindset going into the training that influenced their experience of the, uh, into the session that, that influenced, their, influenced their experience of the stress. Um, there's another study that back in 1998, uh, they took the participants who went through the National Health Survey in 1998, right, interview survey, these researchers. So this is a general annual test that goes on, or survey that goes on in the United States with very broad series of questions about people's general outlook of on, on health and their health and how they're doing. And um, a group took the, the 1998 study participants and then contrasted or compared their data to the national data to the national death index, which is pretty creepy to think that there's a such a thing as a national death index. But in any case, so what they were doing is once saying, okay, who participated in the study in 1998 and of those people who are no longer with us, right? And uh, then how do their outlooks on their health or their health experience influence their mortality? And one of the things they looked at was stress. So there was a question, is your life stressful? And um, there was another question, which was, um, is stress bad for your health, right? So people who answered that life, that, that stress was bad for your health were twice as likely to die than people who said that stress was bad for your health. I mean, excuse me, that their life was stressful, but didn't believe it was bad for their health. I kind of fumbled that, but the bottom line is the belief about the impact of stress was more important than the stress itself in determining people's mortality. So again, the, the, that was the sort of the mindset matters. The way you think about stress influences your experience of stress and how your body can handle it. The next thing to keep in mind when thinking about stress is stress can actually be enhan enhancing. Even Hans Selye, when he saw how the media was taking his work on stress and turning it into a stress is bad, you know, stress is gonna kill you kind of narrative, he came back and wrote a separate book and he, ex he came up with this concept of you stress, which is good stress, responding to a stressor with a sense of meaning, hope or vigor. It can be uncomfortable, but it leads to growth. And, and this is something that we all have experience with, right? Um, and, and before I get into exa some examples of you stress, I should point out the relationship between stress and health has to do with chronic stress or the negative relationship between stress and health. This is uh, Robert Sapolsky. He's a neuroendocrinologist at Stanford University. He wrote this terrific book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And the explanation of that title is basically in a zebra, the stress response is there to get him or her away from the presence of a predator, right? The stress response kicks in when a lion's nearby, the zebra runs away, gets to safety and the stress response turns off. And that's what the stress response was meant for, short term threat, temporary. Um, the problem is modern life can trigger chronic stress, and that's when it starts to impact your health, because when the stress response goes on, it shuts down digestion, it shuts down the reproductive functions, it shuts down or, or weakens the immune system, and so that's great if you're sprinting to get away from a predator, but it's not great if you're living in that stress on a daily basis. It's not good to have your immune system weaken, your digestion not working properly, 
um, and all, and you know, not and your reproductive system impacted as a result of stress. So again, it's chronic stress that's 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 sort of not enhancing, but short-term stress can be enhancing. And a lot of a lot of this concept or this work is outlined in the book by Kelly McGonigal, The Upside of Stress, which I highly recommend. Um, working out stresses the muscles; they get stronger. Studying, it's the effortful recall, the stress on the brain of trying to remember an answer that actually helps lock it in and create learning. Um, our biggest problems at work are sometimes the most satisfying once we've faced them and overcome them. Caring for an aging parent, aging parent or being a parent ourselves can be at times tremendously stressful, but it's also very rewarding and enhancing experience. And so what Aliyah Crum would say is that the experience or anticipation of threat or adversity in our goal-related efforts triggers stress, but the key term there is goal-related efforts. In other words, stress tells you that it matters. Stress means it matters. And in that sense, stress can be enhancing and helping you face a situation that really matters or that to you or that you really care about. And so there you go, stress can be enhancing. And it, the, the more to the story on stress is that we need to take the science or the research rather with a grain of salt. Um, the greatest variable is in stress research is people our mindset about stress matters. And it, the truth is that stress in many instances can be enhancing and can be our friend. Another kid and break. Moving right along. So that, you know, I, I, I told you at the beginning that stress is bad and moving is stressful. And um, then I told you afterwards that actually, you know, it's all how you think about stress and stress can be enhancing. And where does that sort of leave us? Um, I would say that for me, the value of all this information is that, it, you know, the knowledge helps us better understand how to approach our lives, whether we're dealing with stress ourselves or whether we're supporting an assignee who's, who's, uh, who's dealing with the stress of moving. This is the image of knowledge as depicted in the Jefferson Room at the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. And so the knowledge itself about stress, understanding more about stress, thinking about stress outside of what we hear in the media um, can be very useful. And it can help us reframe our experience of stress once we know more um, we can think about it differently. You know, a definition, we've talked about a couple of definitions of stress so far, but I think a useful one for our experience of the pandemic or for helping signees who are dealing with stress is this, the condition or feeling that you experience when you perceive that demands exceed your personal or social resources, that the ones that you have available to you that you're able to mobilize, that feeling of, oh, this is just too much. I'm past my limit, right? That's, that's a feeling that we could probably expect an assignee to feel at at least one point, if not multiple points during a relocation. And it's also a feeling that we probably experienced if at multiple points, if not daily, as we cope with the pandemic. Um, and there, there is no simple, quick fix solution, despite what the magazines want to tell us. There's no magic pill that's going to help us deal with this. But I do want to talk today about some some you know, approaches that I haven't talked about in the past. And I wanna take it from a more personal level. I um, mean, I know I've been talking about uh, stress and the assignee experience, but I think if we can understand how we can cope with st stress better, because um, the pandemic has been hard. I think, uh, I think we have to acknowledge that. And, and, and the last 18 months and, and, and going on have been difficult. But I think the, the better able we are able to deal with that stress, then the better we will be as professionals assisting assignees. Um, there's still a ton of uncertainty that we're facing with the pandemic. You know, how many times have we thought we saw the light at the end of the tunnel only to have it move further away? That's something we're experiencing here in the United, United States. Uh, the Delta variant didn't get here as soon as it did everywhere else, but it's here now. And there's states that have higher hospitalization rates than they had at any point during the pandemic. There's states that are past their last summer peak when we were, you know, shutting things down. So, so that this is still in front of us and understanding how to cope with it and deal with it, I hope would be useful. On the relocation side, if we're gonna be there and be able to assure assignees that we've got this, um, it would help us if we can manage our own personal stress better to be in a position to do that. And to start that conversation, I'm gonna start with the work of this gentleman, Bruce Perry. Um, he's got a few books out there. His most recent one he co-authored with Oprah, I think it's called What Happened to Me, I believe. I haven't read it yet, which talks about um, overcoming trauma. But um, he's, a, he's, he's brilliant. And at this, one of the things I really admire about him is at the start of the pandemic, he started sharing a lot of his material for free online on YouTube. Um, the stuff that, he, that people pay to go and the training that psychologists pay to go and take from him. He was sharing online. And one of the first things he said is that during the current situation, this is way back in March and April of 2020, 
Um, if we take care of ourselves and if we regulate ourselves to so manage our state, basically, we're gonna be better to, able to take care of the people around us, which would include assignees again. And a model, first of all, he talks about this concept of emotional contagion, that if we can be stable in, in, in an emotional good place, it does rub off on the people around us. So we're, especially if we're leaders in our organizations, or again, if we're just assisting assignee through the challenge of moving, we're sort of called on to manage our state so that we're of more use to the people we're assisting and the people around us so that we're able to influence them possibly um, by, by the state that we're in rubbing off on them. And Bruce Perry talks about this concept of the sequence of engagement, right? So if we're gonna interact with somebody and possibly be of influence, the first step is we need to regulate our emotions and manage our state. And we'll talk a little at least from my perspective about techniques for doing that shortly. Um, so if we can, if we're regulated and in control of our emotional state and understanding where we are, then we're in a position where we can relate to the person we're dealing with. If we're not regulated, we can't relate. And reasoning with somebody would come after re relations. So first regulate our emotions, then create connection or relationship with the person that we're with. And then that's when we can start to talk to them. So if they've lost the property they were dead set on, um, you know, we can't reason with them about other options until we've gone through the steps. If you're a parent, this model is endlessly useful. And what you realize is really in the heat of the moment, there's no point in reasoning. Um, you can't go straight to reason when a child's having a meltdown. You can't go straight to reason in the, in, the, in the moment of the most heated emotion. First, regulate the emotions, then reestablish the connection, and then there's the opportunity for learning. Um, it's, 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 it's difficult to do, but it's very valuable. And, and you know, that, that reasoning is influence. That's our position of influence. If we've managed ourselves, if we've established a genuine relationship, then we're in a position to be hopefully a positive influence on those around us including our coworkers or assignees. I use this image a lot and I use it to remind ourselves and I use it typically in the sense of relocation that when we look at individuals dealing with stress who kind of lose it like this, it's not, it's the situation, it's not the person. This is not a bad person. This is a person in a bad situation. You know, if this gentleman um, got to work this morning and the first quarter results came in and they were terrible, then he went to lunch with his top salesperson who quit to, and said he was going to work for a competitor. And then at two o'clock, his teenage daughter called and said, I hate you, daddy, this move is ruining my life. And then at four o'clock, we call him and tell him that the property he chose in Paris for his relocation was rented by somebody with a higher budget. This response makes a lot more sense, actually. So it's not that he's a bad person. He's a person in a very difficult circumstance. And we could use this same model to give ourselves a bit of grace during the pandemic. We're not weak, we're not lazy, we're not negative, we're dealing with a really challenging situation. And I think we owe ourselves um, a bit more grace, I guess is the word that keeps coming to our mind in the face of the current circumstances. So I said I would talk about some techniques and I, this is where I'm gonna kind of, some of this I've talked about before, some of it's new for me and um, I, I hope you'll find it helpful. Um, it's something I've been working on personally and drawing out, sort of modeling out. The first step, if I was going to, I'm going to outline sort of three steps for dealing with a moment or a, a situation where we find ourselves really stressed out. And the first step, step is to name it. There is research about how valuable it is to name our emotions. You know, the neuroscience would be that you're engaging the rational part of your brain to come up with a name for the feeling that you're having, which takes you out of sort of the more emotional part of your brain. That's a simplified explanation, but it's true. If I'm naming my emotion, I'm using a different part of my brain to come up with that name. So the first step is to name it. And there's power in naming it. You know, it does feel better to say, oh, I'm so frustrated. Just saying that out loud um, releases some of the emotion. Or if you've been around a kid and help them identify the fact that they're hungry, just recognizing that they're hungry um, and naming the state that they're in then it, once you've named it, you sort of have some agency or power to deal with it. But if it's just this ongoing negative state and I can't really name it, and I just feel bad, it's difficult to figure out what the next step is. So the first step would be to name it. The second step would be soothe, which I, I, I always feel awkward using as a term in a professional presentation because it seems like something more you do with the child. But the truth is this, um, all any of us can do for ourselves or for anybody else who finds themselves in a really difficult emotional state is to be soothing. You can't reason with somebody. 
you can't explain to somebody. All we can do is soothe. And, and I think soothe will become a more comfortable word for us as professionals. If we think of it a bit differently, if we think of it as sort of painting a bigger picture, right? Um, as pointing out to what is working. You think about the kinds of things a parent says when he's soothing a child, you know, they're there, it's okay, it's gonna be all right. It's stepping back from the details of the specific problem that's the source of our stress in the moment and looking at the broader picture. It's gonna work out, things always work out. It's not that bad if we're a relocation pro professional, but we're almost there, you know, we're 75% of the way done with this relocation, just a few more things to handle. Looking at the bigger picture is soothing, looking at the details is stressful. So broadening our perspective, ourselves, soothing ourselves. And I gotta, I gotta say this naming it and this soothing doesn't always have to happen in, with another person. Just because we're frustrated doesn't mean we need to call uh, somebody on the phone and tell them. It's not that much more powerful to name it to somebody else as it is to name it ourselves because it's our experience. And sometimes it's unhelpful for the other person. I just want to say, you know, we don't always need to vent because it's not always, it can sometimes be a disservice, sorry, um, to the person we're calling. We have to make that judgment call in the moment, I think, about if we want to share it or not. And, when, and it's the same thing. We have the power to use our mind, go back to um, what William James said, our greatest, our greatest power over stress is our freedom or ability to choose a different thought. In essence, that's what soothing is. It's getting my mind off of what's put me in the stress state in the, in the beginning and choosing a different thought um, as to how to understand or face what I'm going through in the moment. And so look at the big picture and soothe. And then the third, and by the way, I want to stress that this choosing a different thought is not um, this sort of what I call toxic positive or what many people call toxic, toxic positivity. It's not, you know, um, just trying to say an affirmation about how great everything is when you feel miserable. You can't really go from miserable to passion or joy or being thrilled about life. It's not the trans, it's not a natural and normal or possible transition. And that's why, you know, when we're feeling down, these incredibly positive, chipper, upbeat people are useless to us and in fact, irritating. So we're not talking about being overly positive. I'm talking about just stepping back, soothing ourselves, looking at things from a broader perspective. And then the third step, so we've got name it, soothe ourselves, choose different thoughts, kind of redirect our attention and then do something different. You know, I chose a walk here. It could be a run. It could be get a manicure. It could be take a nap, take a bath. It could be eat something you enjoy, hopefully not always something that's not particularly healthy for you. Um, anything that's going to shift our mindset. We all, all know what these things are. The sad thing is most of us aren't, and myself included, aren't particularly good at including these things in our life. And I think that one key to managing our state or regulating ourselves overall is to make these types of things a part of our regular routine um, rather than waiting till things are so bad and just saying, oh, I have to go for a walk or I have to take a nap or I'm going to eat a pint of ice cream. <laughs> we don't need to let it get that bad. So again, name it, um, so name it, soothe ourselves, shift our attention um, by looking at the bigger picture and then do something different. Get out and go for a walk. Do something that you enjoy and it's different for all of us, I think. So one way to look at this, one way to look at dealing with stress or this self concept of self-regulation self is, you know, think about the terminology we use when we're off our game when we're stressed out, when life has just been too difficult. People say things, say things like, I'm just not myself, or I'm just out of my mind, or he's out of his mind, I'm not in my right mind. The language we use is, I find fascinating because it speaks to the fact that this isn't me, right? This state that I'm in, this overwhelming emotion of, you know, concern or worry or, or anxiety or just hopelessness, it's not who I really am. And, um, Again, these steps can help us get it, get back in our right mind, naming it, soothing, looking at the bigger picture and doing something different. So I'm going to speak to an example of this. Um, this is one of my real life living heroes. I don't know if you've heard of him. His name is Father Greg Boyle, lives and work in La works in Los Angeles. He's a Jesuit priest who um, was assigned a church in the most gang ridden and gang infested area of Los Angeles in the early 1990s. And the work that he's done is nothing short of miraculous. His first book is Tattoos on the Heart. If you want to look for it, it's fine. I find it very inspiring. But basically, he took this concept of it's not the person, it's the situation, and applied it to the people he was around in the ghetto, in the in, in, in these poor parts of Los Angeles, where not saying these are bad people, these are people in really difficult circumstances. And he started, he created Homeboy Industries, which has a bakery, and they do painting, and 
they have all kinds of businesses they do. Now they're doing solar inst installation and electronics recycling, basically gave people opportunities for jobs and then counseling for alcoholism, tattoo removal. It's the largest, largest gang intervention program in the world and the most successful. And there are now programs modeled on it all over the world. But when Father Greg Boyle talks about taking these people who may have been, you know, who have been shot or who have shot at or shot people who have really um, lived on the fringes of society in a violent and, and criminal world um, and, and working with them, the concept he talks about is returning them to themselves, right? It's like helping them find who they really are, which is more of a life, lifetime thing for them than maybe up for us getting through a stressful state. But I love that language. If you go back to, I'm not myself, he's out of his mind, I'm not in my right mind. This, no, this notion of returning themselves or helping them remember who they are is, uh, is what his work is really all about. And I think that's something we can do for ourselves when we're dealing with stress. And in one way um, that I found useful comes from a three level model that I borrowed from a friend, right? And I'm gonna start with speaking about this from the, from the perspective of physical health. So this is the new model that I've been kind of working on in the writing that I do in the morning. I had a friend um, who was a very successful chiropractor and health practitioner in Los Angeles um, named Howard Cohen. And I saw him give a talk once and he, he, he drew these three lines on the whiteboard and he said, Lou, this, this top line represents health, wellness, and vitality, like the perfect state of health, where, where ideally we should be. The middle line is no symptoms. So we're not healthy and vital, but we don't have any symptoms at the moment. And the bottom line is symptoms. We're in a symptomatic state. Our head hurts. Um, our stomach doesn't feel right. We're having difficulty breathing, whatever the case may be. And so Howie's point was that most people in America, and I can't speak for everybody else, but I kind of see it all around me in the United States, they're fluctuating between no symptoms and symptoms, right? So they're going around, they have no symptoms and they think they're doing okay. And then they get a symptom and they go to the doctor and they get a pill and the pill makes the symptoms go away for a while. And so there are no symptoms and they think they're okay. And then they get another symptom and they go to the doctor and get a pill. They don't ever get up to the top of this scale. They don't ever discover what it means to be healthy, well, vital, and alive because of the way they're eating or because of the lack of activity or because of how they've allowed work to dominate their lives. Whatever the case may be, they don't really get to have the full human experience that comes with being healthy and vital because, they, because of the way they live. So they don't, they don't even really know what that feels like. And so I, a lot of the models I looked at on the brain and behavior and state management were sort of three level models. And so I thought of Howie's model in, a ter in terms of emotion or our state of being. So you got the same three lines, but at the top, instead of health, wellness, and vitality, you have, I don't know, you could plug a lot of motions, emotions in here, emotional states, but I've put passion, connection, joy. The middle, I put meh, which is a sort of not, <laughs> it's an ultimate neutral emotion. You know, it's not good, it's not bad, just sort of eh. And at the bottom, I put fear, depression, powerlessness, loneliness, some of the worst negative emotions that, you know, that we can imagine. And um, just pause for a second and look at this graph and think about where have I been through the pandemic? What would my graph line be like, right? And which of these levels or approaching which of these levels am I most me? Do I most feel like me, right? I think we most feel like ourselves when we're connected with friends, when we're passionate about our work or we're engaged in things that we're passionate about, when we're experiencing joy. I think that goes without saying, we all know that. And so then the question becomes, why, what, what habits do I have that keep me living from you know, fear or just, you know, there's a, this is a, think of it as a scale, right? There, there are more, there are negative emotions above fear, maybe frustration or anger, that are negative, but aren't quite uh, depression or powerless, powerlessness. I mean, and there are positive emotions, happy, engaged, that maybe don't quite reach passion and connection or joy, but are, but are still positive. But the point is, where do we reside mostly? And then if we keep this model in mind, and what are the things that help me get back to myself? Because I think we'd all agree myself, ourself is closer to the top of this chart. And then what can I do to keep myself there? And that's where that name it, um, soothe and and uh, then do something different to sort of shift your perspective. For me, that falls in because when I recognize I'm in the yellow to the red area, I'm going to stop for a second and say, hey, yeah, I'm feeling kind of irritated, right? 
because for a lot of us that we we've got become so accustomed to feeling just like people have become accustomed to thinking that no symptoms means they're healthy we've become so accustomed to feeling meh or below on a daily basis that we don't even notice it and that irritation isn't a momentary thing it sort of lingers through a day because we've learned to tolerate that instead of stopping and saying hey i'm irritated and it's, it's not always necessary to understand what was the cause of the irritation or go back and find the person that irritated us and share our feelings with them. I, I don't know how productive that always is. It's more important to say, I'm not feeling myself. What can I do to change that? And then go through those three steps to, to get to a better place. I mean, would it be better to go back to the person that irritated us and start an argument with them or to go for a walk? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. And so I hope this model is useful. It's something that I've sort of been keeping in mind as I go through my days. And, and, um, and, and I hope I'm getting better at it. And so in ending the talk, um, this, is the, this is the author, Neil, Neil Gaiman. And uh, he tells this great story about once he was asked um, um, to put a, a quote, to create a quote, I think it was for a library wall. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's where this request came from. And um, he, he, what he came up with was this, and what happened next, which is really the power, the powerful question that keeps a story moving forward. If somebody's telling us a good story, that's the question that's always on our mind. It's the thing that helps us, you know, it's, a, it's responsible for binge watching. That's <laughs> something we're probably all familiar with as well. Um, that, it's a very powerful and, and, and what question and what happened next. And I think it also applies to our personal lives, you know? We've, we've lived through this. I mean, hopefully we're nearing the end. Who knows? I mean, we don't know. Hopefully it's weeks and not months left in front of us to face the pandemic. But however long it is, we, there is this question of there was this pandemic. And what happened next? What happened to me personally in particular? Because that's where I have the most agency, right? There was the pandemic and it, it caused this in my life. And my kids were home when I was trying to work. And um, revenue went down or whatever the case may be. But the bigger question is, and then? And that's a question we all have the freedom and power to answer, right? That's a question that we have the agency to do something about, to choose the, the habits, to choose the um, thoughts on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, and to choose the activities that help us come out of this uh, in a better place than we would have been otherwise. And so that's the question I sort of leave us with is, yes, the pandemic is stressful, but what happened next? I'm done. So thank you for your time and attention. I really appreciate everybody. I hope you found this useful. Um, if there are questions, I'll, I'll stay available. And if, if anybody has any comments on that sort of three level model that I came up with, this is the first time I've ever shared it with anybody. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it. But thank you again, Dom and Yura. And thank you everybody for your time today. John, thanks for all hours. Thank you so much. That was um, phenomenal, really phenomenal. I think, I think I said to you after your um, your presentation at the Spring Summit, it it actually allowed um, a lot of us watching it to acknowledge the fact that yes, this has been incredibly stressful, and and for all of us, I think your final slide. I love that that model, by the way. That final slide. And what next? I mean, yeah, what, and then what? Are you, if we've all gone through this, let's hope that something good comes out of it, even if it is, like you say, looking at a model like the one you've developed and, and understanding that, you know, we can move from phase to phase. Does anybody have any questions or comments that they'd like to make? Please just pop them in the chat box. Um, as you know, this will be on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to use it. And uh, John, if you don't mind, I'm going to using it in, in one of our training um, programs. Sure. Um, I was just making so many notes. When you were talking about the, um, the, um, the TRIA social stress test, yes. we used to run an exercise as part of our intercultural training program called Barnga. Did you ever come across that? No, I didn't. There's an intercultural game developer called Tiaji, and it's one of his. And it just really made me think about it because we weren't doing it from the point of view of of measuring stress, but you would see people get so stressed. So basically what you had was every table would have a pack of cards and a set of instructions. You couldn't speak. It was basically, you know, ace is a trump, ace is a high, kings are 10, whatever. And you play the right. game according to the rules. And then the winners have to move to the next table. And then they play the game again, they're playing the same game. What they don't know is that each table has been given different rules. 
And the, ah. the idea is ah. to show how it feels to be translated into a culture where you uh -huh. don't understand the implicit rules. Right. But actually, what came out of it was exactly like that social stress test was how stressed people got because right. suddenly they've moved to a table where aces are low and they're playing by the rules. It's like having, you know, having the, the, the sheets taken away that you're able to rely on when you, it was fascinating listening to that. So yeah, thank you for that. no, I see that. I see, you know, I see, you know, um, some of you may know, I know Dom, you know, my wife's Hungarian and, yeah. and, and that's a, Hungarian and American cultures are very different and she's still learning, you know, these unwritten rules. She's had to figure out that when somebody in America um says oh we should have coffee they they may actually be saying i hope i never see you again you know <laughs> and uh and when somebody yeah. texts you you invited them from a party and they say um it, it's not looking good um in hungary that would mean okay we still might make it but it's not looking good in america that means we're not going to be there i'm just too polite to right. say it directly you know right i so, mean so yeah there's yeah. all these implicit rules that you just don't know and it can create a lot of stress Abs absolutely i remember i mean this is an anecdote off topic with well it, it, it isn't because it does cause stress i remember being in a board meeting um quite a number of years ago and our president at the time was german and I, we'd had a discussion about something and i'd written and i said that's a really interesting idea and I'd, I'd you know put it in the minutes and in the next meeting he kind of came back and said so what about that very interesting idea that we talked about last time and of course to, to somebody brought up in the uk that's a really interesting idea is a way of politely setting them <laughs> back and, and uh, we will not be looking at that again <laughs> and so yeah these things implicit things cause stress the other thing i'm, I'm fascinated by the work of elia crumb thank you very much for bringing that in there i think oh. what's, so, what's so interesting about the whole mind body connection now is it is being examined by institutions like stanford that there's uh, real research money being poured into it yeah oh yeah i think we talked about it harvard has a placebo lab harvard university is yeah. giving out sugar pills and saying they'll cre cure your insomnia or your writer's block and people are taking it and they're studying the impact so yeah the, the thinking is a big part of a big part of health yes mm. corey thank you my czech family struggles with the same unwritten american rules that was fantastic thank you john yeah, yeah for sure it's it's very stressful so, I mean, we were talking before as well. I, I was talking to a colleague in the States and we were talking as we were talking before the call about the, the different cultural aspects that have shaped responses to the pandemic. Yes. Um, and how, you know, America is a very individualistic culture has had a very different response to very collective cultures like Asia, particularly. But even here in the UK, I was saying, well, you know, people kind of queued up to get their vaccine and, and the, the take up of the vaccine was kind of seen like a social duty right and she said to me well that's because you're the country that queues <laughs> right or or stands on the right and walks on the left yeah that doesn't work everywhere unfortunately <laughs> i admire that i think that's a great quality like we talked about it. it's what helped you through through the great war and uh you know there's some there's some value in that you can yeah our fascination we're fascination with our fascinated with our personal freedoms here to a fault, I would say. Um, and and we're seeing we're seeing the the you know the weakness of that approach to life right now. It's a it's just a very, very interesting cultural thing. But again, I want you do wonder if that then also shapes the cultural approach to stress. I mean, you pointed out the cover of the psychology magazine and you know the promises this one yes. magazine will change your life forever. <laughs> um again it's 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 a different interpretation of what you know but what's wrong with that what's wrong with that cover and i hope i mean i i ranted on that more when i shared it the last time but is it implies that this is possible right and so then if it's possible and i'm not doing it then there's something wrong with me which actually yeah. creates more stress yeah. right yeah. it's just wrong and all they're doing they're not trying to help you they're trying to sell magazines and they're trying to sell magazines by playing to your insecurities and worst fears and actually making you less healthy than more healthy. There, there's nothing in that magazine that you couldn't figure out yourself. You know, um, I mean, I, I used to use this example in this talk. I was at, it was a headline uh, not long after the 2016 election of the US that talked about headline stress, you know, and how to overcome headline stress. Everybody in this call could, could figure out how to overcome headline stress, stop reading the newspaper, you know? And, and, uh, and so, so the, we, we have this intuition, whether it's about what to eat or, you know, how to take care of ourselves um, that, that, that is innate. And we need to learn to trust more and not outsource to magazines like that. 
Mm. And even to broaden that out to what we were talking about before we started the call, um, the way that the news media has responded to the pandemic has in itself been extremely stress inducing, I think, for a great many, many people. And you're in that sort of space to, I need to follow this because I need to know what's going on, to I have to live in total denial and just never watch the news again because it right. makes me very, very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. Um, if anybody has any final comments or questions, please um, don't hesitate to put them into the chat box. Um, as I said before, we had um, 80 people signed up for this, so it's going to be a popular one on YouTube. I'll make sure that goes out next week. And, um, and really, all that remains for me to say, John, is as ever, just so thought provoking and so brilliantly put together. I'm so grateful for you doing this for us. Oh, and I was just going to mention one thing as well that I've noted down. Um, I know there are a billion podcasts out there, but one of the best at the moment that looks at um, stress and the mind-body relationship is Breakdown. It's called Breakdown. It's by Maine Bialik, who's the actress who played Amy in The Big Bang Theory, but she's actually a PhD. Oh, wow. She's a PhD neuroscientist. And has oh. taken, and it's very, very interesting. And a, quite a number of the... It's well-researched. That's what I like about it. In the same way That's that great. everything you always present to Euro is so brilliantly researched and delivered. So, John... Thank you, as ever. My, my pleasure. Thank you, Dom, and thank you, everybody, for taking the time. And for everyone who's, who's um, with us today, we really, 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 really hope that we will all be able to get together in Seville. And John, I would love it if, again, you would deliver something for us there. That would be awesome. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, I appreciate the opportunity, yeah? Thank you, everybody, for attending today. Thank you so much again to John. And to everybody watching on YouTube, remember, like and subscribe. Thanks again, John. Take care, everybody. All Bye. right. Bye-bye.